from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression with me, Jerry Baker from the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Delighted you're joining us. If you're not already a subscriber, please do sign up wherever you get your podcasts. Over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be taking a deeper look at the state of modern conservative thinking in America. Now, there's no doubt that the last decade has seen the fracturing of the political coalition built by Ronald Reagan in the 1980s that led the Republican Party and drove it for 30 years or more. A coalition composed very broadly of business interests, evangelical Christians, national security hawks, developed a governing philosophy that matched its respective interests. Tax cuts and small government on the economy, social and culturally conservative approaches to issues such as abortion, and a very assertive and aggressive foreign policy. The disillusionment with the direction of the country in the last few years has seen that coalition fragment. At home, rising economic inequality and stagnation has cast doubt on the virtue of a single-minded, tax-cutting, pro-business approach. The advance of progressive ideology through the major institutions has radicalized social conservatives. And the failures associated with foreign policy interventionism, particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan, have discredited neoconservatives and revived an attraction to isolationism. 2015, Donald Trump came along and channeling many of the frustrations voters felt with Republican leadership, wrested the party away from these groups and drove it in new directions. While Trump's politics remains singular and highly personal, his continuing appeal owes at least in part to his offering of a distinctly new form of populist conservatism. For some time, many conservatives have sought to rationalize and develop these new strands of conservatism to build a new governing philosophy. In our next episode next week, we'll take a look at what this means for domestic policy, in economic and social policy especially. But this week, we're going to examine the emerging contours of a new conservative foreign policy. My guest is Elbridge Colby, one of the leading modern conservative national security thinkers. Colby's a founding member of the Marathon Initiative, a think tank dedicated to preparing the U.S. for a period of great power competition. He served in the Trump administration as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense and was a leading figure in the formulation of the 2018 National Defense Strategy. He's written widely on these matters, including a book entitled The Strategy of Denial, American Defense in an Age of Great Power Conflict which the Wall Street Journal, no less, selected as one of the top 10 books of 2021. And Elbridge Colby joins me now. Bridge, thanks very much for joining Free Expression. Great to be with you, Jerry. So a lot to talk about across. I want to talk about your book and I want to talk about your overall take, obviously, on where U.S. foreign policy, national security policy should be going. Let's start, if we may, with just a quote from an article you co-wrote in Time magazine quite recently, which I think sort of summarizes your point about U.S. policy in an era of great power confrontation. You say it's vital to frame correctly what a conservative approach to U.S. foreign policy should be. This is to put the interests of Americans, their security, freedom and prosperity front and center. This doesn't mean disparaging the interests of others. To the contrary, it requires international collaboration, but it means forthrightly evaluating our foreign policy based on how it serves those concrete interests. Now, isn't that something that every patriotic American, everybody who wants to see America succeed in the world, isn't that the objective of everybody for U.S. foreign policy? What is distinctive about the approach you think the U.S. should be taking in this era of great power cooperation, putting America's interests front and center in a way that others aren't? Well, thanks, Jerry. I mean, I think it is sort of agreed to, in theory, sort of superficially, everybody eventually in the course of making an argument for whatever their preferred foreign policy is will say, and this is an American's interest. You know, so for instance, you'll hear Tony Blinken perorate on the rules-based international order. And at some point, he'll try to connect it to the American people's interests. But I think that's sort of, frankly, kind of lame, (laughs) to be candid. And I think what's different is the term forthrightly, I think we used advisedly, which is to say, look, this is something more, and I think it's conservative. I don't think it's exclusively conservative, but I think the way conservatives or realistic look at the world is to say, look, I take care of my own issues first. That's my primary moral obligation. That's my responsibility as a fiduciary or a steward or whatever you want to use. And I'm going to look at that. I'm going to be unabashed about it. And there's no, there's nothing wrong with taking care of your family first, your community first, et cetera. And you help others where you can. I do think that's a, and it's certainly a different attitude than you see in official and sort of old guard established Washington sort of post-1991. I think the connection with Americans' concrete interests has become very attenuated at best. And the point that you make in the book and you've made in several other pieces too, and I know you were very influential in shaping the uh, defense uh, strategy document back in 2018, is in a sense, the debates we've had in foreign policy in the last 20 years, to some extent, have had the poles of kind of neoconservative intervention, remaking the world in America's likeness, the kind of, you know, ideological zeal behind a lot of what went on in Iraq and Afghanistan, to some extent, that on the one hand, and the kind of 
It's nothing to do with isolationism. On the other hand, we're not going to send a dime of American money and we're not going to lose a drop of American blood pursuing interest in any other part of the world. Tell us, if you would, your conception sits between those two, doesn't it, in a very kind of a realist, traditional, almost traditional realist foreign policy approach. I think that's right. I think that's very well put, Jerry. And of course, the only thing in the middle of the road is roadkill. And, uh, but, but I think in this case, it's a sort of a happy medium, an Aristotelian medium, if, if you will, which is between the extremes. I think Washington establishment or foreign policy since 1991 has been characterized by a kind of hubristic approach to foreign policy, an attempt to kind of transform and sort of pacify the whole world. And whether or not that's a noble aspiration, I don't think it was realistic. And thus, it was not only unwise, but not really optimally moral. But at the same time, I think there's, you know, this sort of the old isolationism. And I think that term can be used as a slur sometimes, but you know, so we'll use the term kind of strong restraint, basically pull back from the world. I, I do think that's naive. I think it's actually closer to libertarianism, which is to say, get the heavy hand of the state or whatever, the power out of things, and things will naturally equilibrate in a positive way. And I just don't think that's how human nature works. I don't think that's how societies work. So I think, as you say, it's this middle course that says, look, grounded always in concretely, let's, let's try to be concrete and direct and in ways that are incredibly communicable to the American people. How is it that what we're talking about is practically in their interest? And my argument is colloquial realism. I'm not talking about some academic theory, but just, you know, the basic idea, look, the world's a tough place. You got to take precautions. You got to be strong when you need to be, et cetera, but you shouldn't overdo it. That kind of attitude. And then so you look at the world that way, you say by far the top challenge is, is China, which is to say it's 10 times the size of Russia. I mean, it's got an increasingly aggressive leader, so we don't even need to speculate about that. And the stakes are, are huge. And I think this, Jerry, is where the rubber meets the road and where the argument is often kind of falls, you know, across the, the chasm a little bit is I think Americans' concrete interests are really, really, really going to be determined by who controls Asia. I mean, it sounds archaic, but I think that's ultimately what the Chinese are trying to pursue in the sense of a secure economic sphere. The stakes here are economic. If the Chinese do that, you can bet they are going to make our lives here in the United States and others in our allied countries a lot worse. Because why? They're going to make their country the top economy, the top universities, the top technology companies, the top military, at the top source of information and news and media and opinion, etc. And that's going to be very bad for Americans. Doesn't mean we need to land on the shores of Fujian province and liberate China. I hate communism, but it doesn't mean we need to change their government. It does mean we need a balance of power. We need a situation in which Americans' freedoms and economic prosperity are secure from that kind of hegemonic influence and ultimately threat. One of the few areas where we have bipartisan agreement in this country is, is on this question of China. I think most people would agree with that characterization of China, of the Asia theater as the dominant theater for U.S. foreign policy now in the next however many years, decade, half century, whatever, and that we've already entered a period of, call it Cold War 2.0, or whatever you want to call it, it's a, a period of rising tension between the US and China and the need for the US to deal with that effectively. But in practical terms, what does that mean? And are you being critical of what the US has done with regard to Russia in the last year, supporting Ukraine militarily and financially and uh, with military support, with weapons and training and all the assistance it's given? But my question is, and, and largely on the grounds that China is the main threat, this is a distraction from China, essentially, we've got to focus our resources, our attention and everything else on the China challenge, particularly Taiwan. And again, we can come to that. Why can't the US do both? Or, you know, as someone like Neil Ferguson would put it, the US doesn't have a choice. The US can't say there's a strategic threat over there, but sorry, it's not the really big strategic threat that we're focused on, so we're not going to deal with it. Why isn't it right for the US to deal with the threat from Russia? Why is there a binary between the two? Uh, a couple of things. First of all, I think Putin's invasion of the Ukraine is an abominable act, and the Ukrainian defense of their territory is, is a just act. I think we have a, a strong interest in Ukraine's ability to resist Russian invasion, but it's not our primary interest. And my friend, Neil Ferguson, for whom I have just the highest respect, actually put it very well in his interview with Peter Robinson. He said, we can't choose. But then immediately after, he said, well, as Bridge points out, we don't have enough to go around. Okay. So, I mean, Neil is, is a brilliant man. And I think if he were here with us, he, he actually can see the point because Neil's point is we should be pursuing detente with China. Now, my view is we can get to detente once we've built up a position of strength. But the problem is power scarcity. And this, Jerry, is, is a crucial thing. And I would humbly submit to your colleagues at the Wall Street Journal op-ed page. I mean, I, I'm a big admirer of them, but they're not grappling with reality. I mean, people who for the last 10 or 15 years have been decrying too little spending on defense are now saying that we can do everything. That's just not accurate. Now, it doesn't mean that we can do nothing. And my position is that is not that we should do nothing in Ukraine. My position is Wall Street Journal's got a lot of readers and businesses. If you're going to meet your priority, you focus on your priority. It's a basic truism of successful executive management, right? And that's not what we're doing. Instead, we're saying we can walk and chew gum. Now, it's one thing for 
John Kirby and the Biden administration to say that because they think that, you know, allies and U.N. resolutions are going to make a difference. It's really another thing for Hawks to say that I've it's been a big disappointment for me over the last year to be kind of a, alone on this point of we don't have enough to go around and from people who have been saying that for years, not reckoning with the reality. And I mean, you mentioned the 2018 National Defense Strategy. The biggest shift there was a shift in what's called the Force Planet Construct, because we recognized we were not in a position to fight simultaneous wars, especially in a great power context. And we needed to focus on one where we were losing the edge and it's eroded further, which is vis-a-vis China. Now, this doesn't mean that, again, that we don't do anything, but it means we should actually be saying particular munitions, and we could rattle them through like the HIMARS, the NASAMs, and, and Patriots, and so forth, but also the attention of the industrial base, which is scarce. And the journal has been doing a lot of great reporting on this, the scarce subcomponents, and those are not going to be fixed soon. So we should be saying, this is the priority, money. We've sent a ton of money to Ukraine. We, how much that money has gone to Ukraine? That Congress didn't even appropriate grants for Taiwan. Yes, Taiwan's a rich country, but they're way behind the threat. That's the reality. And I think actually, Jerry, that, you know, my sense of the year, it really the calendar year 22, there was a kind of a sort of a, almost a euphoric time of dimension. I understand that at a human level, but strategy should not be based on euphoria and hope and sort of romanticism. Strategy should be based on reality and empirics. And I think now we're seeing, and the administration's making clear, I mean, the Ukrainians themselves are saying the offensive is not likely to do well. I hope it does do well. It's possible they kick the Russians out, but then they probably will turn into cross-border war. My view is Russia will remain a serious threat. But China's already talking about 2027. And a lot of these people, especially on the right, including your colleagues at the journal op-ed page, are saying, oh, things are getting better. But you know, on the other side of the page, they're saying, well, we can only build 1.2 submarines until 2028, or we can't build more than two frigates, et cetera. So it's time, time, time. And my view is, let's get really real about this and prioritize accordingly. I don't speak for the journal editorial page, but let me say what I think they would say in their defense. First of all, it's perfectly consistent to say, Yes, we need to support this Ukraine assistance to Russia on the one hand. And secondly, yes, we absolutely do need to significantly increase our defense capabilities. I don't think there's necessarily an inconsistency there. In fact, the commitments we're making to Ukraine only highlight the defense gap that we have and enhance the need for us to redouble our efforts. That's the first thing. Second point they'd also say, and a lot of people you know, very strongly support the Ukraine war would say is, it's not an either or between Ukraine and Taiwan or Russia and China. It is actually an and because Russia is as the two countries repeatedly demonstrate and declare, China's closest ally. They've committed themselves to this alliance without limits. Russia, Putin pretty well sought the approval of uh, Xi Jinping, I think, before he certainly forewarned Xi Jinping about his invasion of Ukraine before it happened. And defeating Russia, or even just inflicting massive military losses, which clearly Ukraine has already done, massive strategic setbacks for Russia in Ukraine. By the way, not the loss of any American lives, but just a lot, I agree, but the expenditure of American treasure. Achieving that is an enormously effective blow in terms of improving America's strategic position, both vis-a-vis Russia, but also vis-a-vis Russia's great ally, China. Right. Let me take this in sequence. One, the problem with that argument is time. Time, 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 time is central, right? So we are depleting and using up things that cannot be replaced for years. If you look at the CSIS weapons tracker, these things are not going to be replaced for sometimes up to close to 10 years. So that's the reality. And Xi Jinping's date, we don't know, but the orienting point is 2027. So things are very unlikely to be replaced. And that's the fundamental problem, is that people who know about the defense industrial base know that those problems are not going to be quickly fixed. In fact, the situation may actually be getting worse before it gets better. So we need to live in the here and now, right? This is the critical important. Secondly, there are direct trade-offs. For instance, some people say that Taiwan would not be a ground war. That's false. In fact, the CSIS study that I actually think was relatively sanguine on our performance, said the number one thing is the performance of Taiwanese ground forces, because we would have to assume that the Chinese would land substantial forces by air and sea on the island of Taiwan. And air defense, which is a critical thing. By the way, I think one of the reasons that the administration may now be actually pushing towards negotiations is they realize this problem is becoming more acute, especially because we have depleted a lot of stockpiles and we are going to increasingly be cutting into bone. Your third point that China and Russia are connected. Actually, Jerry, I think this makes the case for focusing on China all the more, because 15 years ago, if China had asked Russia to distract the United States to help them with a Taiwan scenario, the Russians would have said, go take a hike. Five years ago, they might have said, hey, well, maybe we'll consider it but I don't think so. Now they have enormous leverage. And so clearly, if you're thinking from Beijing's point of view, it's a godsend if you can keep the Americans tied down in Europe and depleting their capabilities, or 
you broker a deal, your Nobel Peace Prize, and you drive wedges with the Europeans. So now I actually think, if anything, that close alignment makes it all the more important that we focus rigorously because we have to assume that they would act together. And I think the last point on victory, look, I hope the Ukrainians are victorious, but we need to make strategy based on reality, which is like, ultimately, a victory assumes the other side agree, right? I mean, Fiona Hill, who knows the Russians very well, she said, I think, in the postman in the journal the other day, there's no evidence. And Putin gave a huge speech at VE Day. So even if the Russians fall apart, and I hope they do, we can't expect that they're just going to roll over. And even if he gets shot in the back of the head, who's he going to be replaced by? And who's that person? Who has? What that means is that the Russians are going to continue to be a threat to Europe over the long haul. What's my solution? Not abandoning Europe, not zeroing out our support, but getting the Europeans to step up and take primary responsible for their own conventional defense, which is well within their economic and military capacity if they put their minds to it. Let me take up immediately on that, Then I've read you talking about the important that Europe should do more in its defense, and I think everybody, again, agrees with that. But you say time, time, time when it comes to the need to replenish U.S. defense material that's being used in Ukraine, and that you know, it will take years probably to replenish some of those key weapon systems that we've been contributing to Ukraine. The U.S. has been urging the Europeans to do more in their own defense for at least 50 years. It was the dominant story in NATO throughout the Cold War, and it's been the dominant story in NATO since then. We had this great turning point moment, supposedly in Germany last year, where the Ukraine war made them suddenly rethink. And yes, they all had to do more in their own defense. It's words, words, isn't it? I mean, if the U.S. had not contributed what it has contributed to Ukraine over the last year, the European contribution, A, would not have been there because they would almost certainly have sought peace with Putin because of their need for his energy. And B, they wouldn't even be beginning to build up the kind of resources necessary now. So while you say you really hope the Ukrainians beat Russia, isn't the only way to give the Ukrainians a fighting chance there is with the U.S. weapons because nobody else is going to supply them. But Jerry, that policy will lead to a neglect of the Taiwan situation. And at the end of the day, there's a choice. And the, the fundamental fact is that Asia is more important and China is a far more formidable rival, far more order of magnitude more formidable. So you make very good points in a vacuum, but there are trade-offs. We can't do everything. Where are we going to take risk? Your course and the course that we've been pursuing is a course that takes on greater risk in Asia. And I think that's akin to saying we have acute migraine going on right now, very painful, might go to the hospital. That's what we're focused on, but we also have acute heart disease. I haven't had the heart attack yet, but if the heart attack happens, it could kill us, right? That's the big problem. The other thing about NATO is we did a much better job of burden sharing. When European NATO was a lot smaller during the Cold War, the Europeans spent close to 50%. Why? Well, the threat was greater. But also, you know what? We put a lot of pressure on them. Remember the Mansfield Amendment? Remember the balance of payments crisis? Eisenhower was not going to get fleeced by the Western Europeans. What's happened since then is, let's be honest, the Europeans have seen, look, we can demilitarize. It's very advantage. We, we can put it into social programs. And the deal with the Americans is the Americans get to be the world leader and Madeleine Albright and George W. Bush get to say they're the indispensable nation. And so the Americans occasionally will come through and ask us for more money. But until Trump, they didn't actually believe it. And I think the critical, I think it's been a major failure of this administration and I think some Republicans as well, is not to put pressure on them because we're not doing them any favors. But at the end of the day, if we come to a choice, we have to choose Asia first. I mean, if Taiwan falls, the whole situation could really be undermined. And it's not like we're just going to say, oh, you know, we'll go along. And by the way, the Europeans are very unlikely to back us in that situation because their economies are fundamentally tied. I mean, every other week you read in the in the journal of the FT that, you know, German or French economic delegations going to China. And of course they have to. That's the world's largest market. What are they going to do? So we have to be really realistic about what we can expect. If the U.S. had not done what it's done in Ukraine in the last year and had not led NATO in its solidarity with Ukraine and had not committed all that military support to Ukraine, we can reasonably assume that, that Russia would have achieved most of its least immediate objectives. It might not have been able to completely control and occupy the country, but it would have had much more success than it has. Presumably, Ukraine would be suing for peace or, you know, Zelensky would, would either be in a grave or in some sort of Russian prison. Given that you think that the support has been wrong, are you saying that it would be, I'm not trying to mischaracterize you here, we'd have to just accept the fact that Russia had essentially annexed Ukraine, would now be threatening other Eastern European countries, would be significantly enhanced in its strategic capabilities. We just have to accept that because Europe just doesn't matter as much as Asia. Well, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. I mean, in fact, the U Ukrainians defeated the initial Russian foray, so I disagree with your characterization of what would have happened. The Ukrainians basically on their own, based on the arming and training that had happened long before in the year since 2014 which made a lot of sense, they defeated the Russian attempt to capitate the state. So we're basically talking about something happening in the relatively kind of eastern portions 
of Ukraine, where the lines had stabilized, not stabilized, but the lines had kind of formed roughly by later spring, I would imagine, of last year. So I don't agree at all with your characterization of, of what would have happened. Like they weren't going to march on Kiev. So are you saying that hundred plus billion dollars of USA has not only been a risk from the US point of view, but actually hasn't really contributed much to the war effort? No, no. What I'm saying, I think it's hard to know how much of an impact this made. But I think one of the points that's there's this odd paradox in the kind of line of argument in some of yours is that the Russians are both incapable of breaking through even Ukrainian lines, despite hammering themselves with the Wagner and Bakhmut and stuff, but also are on the verge, if they crack the lines, they're going to march all the way to like the Elbe or something like that. The Russian military has been dramatically eroded, and that's a point that you made. And that has been an advantage, but that advantage is diminishing marginal returns because the Russian military, especially in its longer range power, this is not Wunstead, like, you know, it's not Guderian, like going through the Ardennes and breaking out in northern France. Like they can't even sustain it. Look, all those trucks that got formed up north of Kiev in the early part of the war, right? So my point of view is, and I don't have teams of analysts working for me with classified information, et cetera. I'm making my, based on open sources and what I can read. So I can't give you precise, but what I would have done is I would have said, we absolutely will zealously prioritize Taiwan. And if it ever comes in contrast, we're going to focus on Taiwan and we are going to put a ton of pressure on Europe, particularly Germany, to step up and do what's right. And the administration has not done that at all. So I think actually what they've done wrong is the things that you're lauding, elements of it have been positive, but it's also completely taken the air out of any sense where Europe could actually really step up because it's like, oh, the Americans are back. It's going to be the good old days. And yeah, they say they pivot to China, but it's never going to happen. That's what they actually think. We're going to take a break there. But when we come back, I'll have more with Elbridge Colby on the challenge from China and how the US should be facing it. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. I'm back with Elbridge Colby, leading conservative foreign policy commentator. And we're talking about the threat from China and how the U.S. should be dealing with it. What should the U.S. be doing right now with regard to Taiwan? Well, Taiwan is the obvious flashpoint in the U.S.-China relationship. Dramatically greater urgency for making sure that there's a denial defense of Taiwan. And that means basically the ability to defeat a Chinese invasion of the island, because I think anything short of that is going to be too risky for China. They're not going to do it. If they're going to do it, one of the lessons of Ukraine, and Bill Burns has said the same thing, is don't mess around, go big or go home. OK, if we can stop them from going big, then they will stay home. Right. And my fear is that we are cutting it way too close. This is one of the things where we get into specifics and people tend their eyes glaze over. They think it's not important. But I would go back to the tried and truism, you know, for want of a shoe, the kingdom was lost. Right. That's kind of the thing. Again, to use the example of the Battle of France, it was a relatively kind of narrow breakthrough in the Ardennes that allowed the whole Anglo French forces, the Belgian forces to be rolled up. Right. If you have relatively marginal breakthroughs in conventional forces or advantages, they can have major, major effects. So that's what I would do. And that means we would focus zealously, consistent, bearing in mind the limits of what our defense industrial base can do, press the Taiwanese especially to dramatically step up their self-defense efforts. I mean, I think it's unconscionable that they're only spending two and a half percent when there's when they're next to like the first superpower to arise in the international peer superpower since the United States itself, the first peer economy of the United States in 150 years. And they're acting like it's no big deal. Much more pressure on Japan. At the same time, though, Jerry, and this is where I'm different, I would say, than a lot of Republicans, I agree with them in a lot, I think there's a lot of peacocking. You know, John Bolton is in the journal pages a lot. I think that's peacocking. Talking a big game, provocative, calling Xi Jinping Hitler or what have you, without backing up, that's a really big... If it's really Hitler, you better make sure that you're overprepared, right? And so I would actually say, I'm, I'm actually supportive of some of the things like Neil and Graham Allison and even Kissinger are pointing to. So basically, we should be turning down the temperature rhetorically but strengthening our position in a manifestly defensive way. So I think of it as speak softly and carry a big stick if we're going to go back to classical American realism. But aren't the Chinese much more likely to take a front or a fright at the big stick than to be pleased by the softened language? Isn't the risk here that if the US dramatically contributes to the hardening of Taiwan's defenses, that dramatically reduces the time scale in which China may be thinking they'll have to move very quickly before the risks of invading Taiwan are that much greater. So I appreciate there's a balance here, but isn't that the risk that you actually provoke China into going early because they want to go before you've really done all you can to support Taiwan? Well, yes, that is unfortunately a dynamic. That was the dynamic that I had hoped that we would avoid when I was doing the national defense strategy was to get ahead of the problem that we could strengthen our position in the Pacific so much that we would not face this problem. Now we are in a situation where we have essentially two choices. We can strengthen our position. The Chinese would very seriously think that they may have a closing window of opportunity, which is a real problem. 
and we can try to mitigate it, but we can't solve it. The alternative is not really to do anything and then just be vulnerable to the Chinese, which I don't think is a prudent course of action. So I think the best we can do, again, is to speak softly and carry a big stick and really focus our military investments and capabilities and what we do with our allies on things that would matter for this fight. So actually, you know, I, in a lot of ways, I think AUKUS is a positive achievement, but there's been a lot of attention. It's over the long haul. I actually think we need things that are much more in the next kind of five to 10 years that are just going to make it very difficult for the Chinese to effectuate this. And I think, you know, my message to the Chinese is to say, look, A, this is not about dismembering China. I think some of the hot rhetoric on the CCP is ill-advised. And I hate communism, but that's not the point. Like, we don't want to turn this any more into an existential cage match than we absolutely have to. And the second point is, look, if you're China, this is a cosmic roll of the dice. There are potentially enormous benefits involved. Absolutely. That is true. But you are also going to take on the Americans. And if we are capable and resolute and focused, there's a big chance that they could fail. And that's going to go very badly for China and certainly the Chinese leadership. So there, there are big downsides. But this test is not over yet. Do you think the U.S. political and diplomatic posture towards China and Taiwan needs to change too. Obviously, it's maintained this rather curious strategic ambiguity for decades since essentially recognized the People's Republic back in the early 70s, committed to itself to supporting the People's Republic's one China approach. Should China attempt to retake Taiwan by force, then the EU reserve the right to come to Taiwan's aid. Now, seen in the last year, Biden has sort of walked all over that, wandered all over that strategic ambiguity by repeatedly saying the US would defend Taiwan and then it had to be walked back. Do you think the time has come for a much more direct repudiation of that strategic ambiguity and a much more direct expression of support for Taiwan? No on a shift to the political status quo. So my view is American interests are best served by the political status quo defended by a stout military strength. So I don't think we should in any way signal any change to our political assessment of the island of Taiwan. Now, our view of the one China policy has always been that there are Chinese on both sides of the strait, recognize there's one China. However, we have never taken a formal official position on the ultimate disposition of the island of Taiwan. That's important to maintain. I think we should stick to that position. I think that's part of one of the steps for war avoidance is to try to communicate to the Chinese that this remains a live issue. One of the things that might precipitate them to war is if they say, look, we're never going to resolve this peacefully, and we should leave that door open. I think we want a future Deng Xiaoping to come back and say, this is something that can be future generations can resolve. Xi Jinping was too hot. He was too aggressive. He caused us too many problems, like in the way that, you know, after Khrushchev, at some sense, Brezhnev and detente, like that kind of thing is what we want. I think what I would say is I support strategic ambiguity, capital S, capital A, which is a political arrangement that basically has its purposes. But small S, C, strategic clarity. And I believe we're already there, which is that our military and our allied militaries understand that they should be prepared to fight to maintain the status quo. But I think the last thing we should be doing, and for instance, you know, just Bolton again, Bolton was meeting with pro-independence groups on Taiwan. That is incredibly ill-advised because it's not in American interests. It's highly provocative to the Chinese. And like, I'm not saying that they're morally right, but if you really want to avoid a war, we should be judicious in where we take the provocations. And those provocations should be ones designed to strengthen our stick, our military, our defenses. And the other thing about the Chinese, yes, they're going to complain about it. But at the end of the day, the military that we're building is manifestly defensive. It's clearly designed to defend the first island chain perimeter. Now, you could, the Chinese can say what they want. But this is not a military designed to land on the coast of Fujian and force the CCP out of power or that's going to, you know, free Tibet. It's clearly not that. So at the end of the day, they're going to have their rhetoric, but they can see that they are not fundamentally threatened by it. What message are we sending to the the government and the people of Taiwan in this? Again, with your approach, you're sort of stepping up of Taiwan's defenses in the way that you describe diplomatically, carefully, but without provoking the Chinese in the ways that you talk about. But are we not essentially in doing this, shifting further in this direction that you favor, giving the Taiwanese an implicit guarantee engaging in a military guarantee that if they were to be attacked, then not only do they obviously have U.S. missile systems and U.S. warplanes and everything else, but actually the full capabilities of the U.S. Pacific Command would be brought to bear to help them defend themselves. Aren't we essentially sending them that message if we go down this route? It's sort of emboldening them, you mean? Yeah. And again, pushing us more away from strategic ambiguity because it gives us a moral obligation. I mean, the more the Taiwanese, you know, you defend yourselves and then it the moral obligation it places on us, surely, to come to their defense if and when they are attacked. Well, 
just on the specifics, I mean, I think if they declare independence, they should understand that's the most likely way to get us not to come to their defense. Like, we'll make our decision based on what parameters, but they should not declare independence, in my view, or get close to it. And actually, in, in credit to President Tsai and her administration, they have not done that. Now, I don't know about future DPP administrations, but I think that's important that we communicate that. We are not supporting Taiwan independence. On the other hand, that's more of a strategic issue, which is, look, ambiguity is most tenable when there's a lopsided military balance, right? Because we could have this kind of Kissingerian, very confusing and Byzantine kind of arrangement. The Chinese would barely leave port before they would all be sunk until quite recently, right? Like we could beat them with one hand tied behind the back and like two of our fingers tied to our hands, right? That was the reality. That has fundamentally changed. In that situation, ambiguity is very dangerous because ambiguity basically says it gives you more flexibility notionally as the guarantor but it also says to the potential aggressor, well, I can more reasonably calculate they won't come, especially if the costs are high. This half-pregnant idea, and this is why you've seen like in the Cold War, why we have gone over time in these kinds of situations to sharp lines. So my view is it's worth defending Taiwan. It's natural. It's critical in the first island chain. It plays to our advantages as a military and society power, which is aerospace and maritime and high technology power. On the other hand, Jerry, if we continue in the kind of attitude where people think we can do everything all over the place, we're moving into the position where we may not be able to substantiate that commitment. And in that context, if we go back to the first principles of what this is for, we cannot break our sphere in the defense of Taiwan. I mean, my favorite example of this is we all love Churchill, right? And Churchill wanted to send more Spitfires and Hurricanes at the French request in the Battle of France in 1940. But the RAF said, if you do that, we can't defend the home islands. We risk getting in that situation, both because of our own I would say hubris and unwillingness to reckon with reality, but also because of the Taiwanese lassitude. I mean, they should look like Israel or at minimum Finland. And that's not where they are. And that's very, very, very dangerous. Do you think the American people would, if necessary, support sending their sons and daughters to fight for and again, if necessary, die for the defense of Taiwan? Given everything that we've seen with regard to misadventures overseas in the last 20 years, where I entirely agree with you on the mistakes that have been made, given what that's done to the way in which Americans view foreign engagements, is Taiwan such a vital, vital part of American strategic defense that American people would support military action, which could result in the loss of many, many, many American lives. I don't know, Jerry. And people sometimes say, oh, you know, if you don't support Ukraine, are you sure they're going to support Taiwan? And I said, no, I don't know. And that's why I'm out there making this, this case all the time, because the best thing is what we did in the Cold War in Europe, which was to deter the war. And nobody knows. I mean, Ronald Reagan and others said afterwards that we never would have used nuclear weapons first, but it was sufficiently effective to keep the Soviets from invading Western Europe. Like, did it make sense to lose American cities to save West Germany and Denmark? Not really, but it was a sufficiently convincing strategy to deter them. That is what we want. And I think in a way, it may not really be up to us because I think the Chinese are already anticipating that we would come to Taiwan's defense. And so they're likely to attack us preemptively and also our allies. And this is the key thing. It's not about Taiwan. If it were just about Taiwan, we might have a different strategy. It's about the whole position in Asia. And that's not like some geopolitical playing a game of risk or something. That's like, who's the master of the world's largest economic area? Because if the Chinese defeat us in the Western Pacific, well, what's the Philippines going to do? Are Americans more willing to defend the Philippines than Taiwan? I don't think it's like, you know, it's six of one, half dozen of the other, right? And in that context, it's going to be a lot harder to defend those situations because it's like, if you've lost, pick your example you're in a weaker position. So my view is we're best off holding the line where it is and being so strong and focused, but also restrained at the same time that the other guy never tries it. That's, Jerry, I think kind of core message, especially to like this, I walk in Shigama, why are we taking the risk? Because like these people, Xi Jinping is manifestly preparing for war. And he is a brutal and ruthless guy who has purged his whole opposition. The China hands would say, well, he thinks that we're strangling him. Yes. He thinks he's acting defensively. That is like the worst point. It's like not like we could just like throw him a couple of coins and he'd be satisfied. No, no, no. He thinks we're strangling them. And he thinks this is existential. So shouldn't you be like not even getting close to the edge of the cliff? You know, people, oh, well, we'll we'll give the Ukrainians this and then we'll bomb Iran and its nuclear program and then we'll do this new stuff in Venezuela. Are you crazy? (laughs) Like really, like speaking very frankly, we are really on the potential verge. Like Russia is not going to get to the English Channel, but China is this pure superpower. Shouldn't we act like it? 
setting aside Taiwan for the moment, the broader US-China competition, the tension there, how do you see that? Again, I, I agree, Taiwan is obviously the most important flashpoint. And maybe if we do what you're describing, we can avoid outright conflict or confrontation with China. But the larger strategic challenge of a rising China, you've described it very well, much greater military capability than it had 30 years ago, extraordinary economic growth by you know, many measures as big as the US may get larger, classic rising power, stable power situation. But one particular question to you is, how does the US navigate that given the economic integration of those two countries. I'm sorry to be very prolix, but when US companies left Russia after the invasion of Ukraine, it was a minor, minor blip in their finances, right? That my favorite statistic is Starbucks, I think, had 200 stores in Russia. Starbucks, as I think, has something like six or 7,000 stores in China. That's just a one small, colorful example. The US and Chinese economies, financially, capital markets, manufacturing, in services trade, are incredibly tightly intertwined. How does that play into this intensifying strategic competition that we're likely to see over the next five or 10 years? It's a great point, Jerry, and actually one where I have a little bit of a heterodox view. Actually, I'm more sanguine about trade than many. And the reason is because, and this is kind of comes from my sort of realist viewpoint, I actually think it's very difficult to turn economic leverage via things like sanctions into sort of what I would call decisive political outcomes. Like if you want a country to give up its independence, or even like its WMD program, putative WMD program in the case of Saddam Hussein or Cuba or North Korea, right? So that's been bad news for us. Bad news, the Russians are not changing their behavior based on our economic sanctions. But it's also good news in the sense that I actually think China will find it very difficult to bring other countries to its will in a really meaningful way through economic sanctions. We're already seeing, and the journal has been reporting a lot about this very ably over the last few years, where they're having difficulties. You know, for instance, like BRI projects, and there's resistance, Ecuador, even places like Kenya and Sri Lanka. By the way, they seem to want to make money off of these things. You know, look at their lending in the development context where they're expecting to get paid back. So that's the good news. Bad news is that it makes the military balance all the more salient because it becomes more attractive. But if we get the military balance right, I actually think that we can have a fair degree of economic engagement. Now, I would welcome and defer to my good friend Orrin Cass and others if they were saying we should decouple for other reasons. Like, that's totally fine. But from a strategic point of view, the point is to be able to give us the autonomy and the basis to make decisions on our own terms. And if we can then decide the degree of decoupling from a strategic point of view, I think if we're basically like not relying on them on like semiconductors and pharmaceuticals and antibiotics, that kind of thing, then I think we should be okay. Cut, I mean, we've seen this repeatedly. Cut off pineapple imports from Taiwan. What did the Taiwanese do? Well, now the Taiwanese are more anti-China, similar in the Philippines, similar in Japan with the rare earths. Now look at Australia, nobly standing up against a country to which it's like really dependent as an exporter. So I think market participants need to be realistic and say there's a very militarily significant crisis if we're lucky, God forbid. So you take your risk. You should put a serious risk premium. And by the way, you don't even need to worry about that because apparently the Chinese are like preventing you from getting accurate information. So final question, Bridget. But I want to just turn it quickly to the politics. You served in the Trump administration at the Pentagon. We're seeing a, again a lively internal debate within the Republican Party, and we've got Donald Trump and other candidates out there. Trump looking at the moment the, the favorite candidate. I don't want you to ask you to endorse a particular candidate because I'm sure you're not going to do that anyway. But do you think, from your experience of serving in the Trump administration, what you've seen of him? And what you've seen of him since then and kind of the things he's saying and doing about China and Russia and elsewhere. Do you think that the kind of approach that you favor, that Trump is essentially on side with that and that, that Trump is the most likely of the Republican field to actually execute that kind of a, you know, significantly different strategic approach in the next four years? Well, look, I'll say this. I mean, I think President Trump, I think the most important legacy on these kinds of things that he'll leave is the shift on China that needed to happen. And there was rhetoric about it before, but especially the kind of recognizing that China was a rival and being willing to be confrontational. That is, in a century, I think that will be written about in, in a meaningful way. I mean, I can't speak for President Trump or any of the other candidates. What I do think is the next person is going to be president of the United States is going to be president in the year 2027. And that person had better be ready. And I don't think that the right strategy is going to be one that hopes for the best and tries to do the freedom agenda again. I also don't think that saying, hey, Xi Jinping and I can cut a deal and that's reliable, that's going to work either. We're going to need to be really focused on a position of strength, be seen as really serious and formidable and not to be trifled with. But on the other hand, somebody you could deal with. And I think in that sense, we want to go back to the Republican Party before we lost our way, I would say, you know, maybe in the late 90s, but certainly by the time of the Bush 43 administration and say, you know, Eisenhower, Nixon, Reagan. I mean, Reagan, for all his rhetoric, was peace through strength, barely employed the military, was focused on the central theater. 
that's the kind of attitude that, that we need to go back to. Elbridge Colby, very good way to end this. Thank you very much indeed for joining Free Expression. Well, thank you so much. That's it for Free Expression this week. Thanks for joining me. Please join me again next week when we'll be looking at another aspect of the changed conservative thinking in the era of Donald Trump. We'll be looking at domestic, economic and social policy. In the meantime, thanks very much for joining us and goodbye. Goodbye.